Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to, uh, to Tracky. I'm Bob Audet, data management leader of uh, GuideHouse, so our data management practice. Uh, very excited to introduce today's session, which is focusing on data-driven disruption, uh, building a data culture that really revolutionizes uh, your business. And we're going to learn a lot more about that in a minute, about what that really means and what that takes. But a few logistical things before we get started. Today's session is being recorded. So three months from now, you should be able to access this wonderful presentation on MIT's uh, YouTube channel uh, regarding questions. We'll certainly field questions from the room, probably uh, about 10 minutes toward the end. Uh, I, would, I definitely would like everyone to use a mic. Please introduce yourself, say where you're from, and also for those that are participating virtually, please use the Wahoova app to post your questions, and we'll make sure we try to get to those questions as best as we can. So with that, I have the distinct pleasure uh, of introducing Monica uh, Kazirski. Really good. Uh, Vice President of Global Data Analytics and AI of Herbalife Nutrition. And you know, based on Monica's uh, background, over 20 years of experience in, in helping leading data-driven uh, capabilities across numerous different um, organizations, and very large ones, uh, multi-billion dollar organizations, transforming cultures, embedding data capabilities and analytical capabilities into the DNA of organizations. Um, and, and with that, I'm gonna pass it over to you to, to get started. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> So, hi everyone. I am just so, so excited to be here. And believe it or not, this is my very first time in, in Boston. And, and I love it. <laughs> I am so impressed with the city and like really captivated by its charm and, and how unique it is. So I'm just really curious, do any of you live here? Are there, is there anybody in the room from Boston? Yeah, we've got a couple. So, I, I just think you're very, <laughs> very lucky. <laughs> and so for all of us data leaders here in the room, I think this is a very special and, and unique time. And it is a very unique forum uh, organized by MIT that, that really hel helps us collaborate and exchange thoughts and ideas. And especially at the time when as data leaders we're gaining more visibility and we're gaining more momentum and, and we're accelerating how we're able to derive and, and bring the value for our organizations. Now, as data leaders, we know that data culture is important and data disruption is what drives the innovation for, for your company. Now, when you attend the Gartner conferences and read Harvard business studies, you, you hear that many companies really desire to have this data-driven culture. Now, but you, when you read these papers, you also learn that the bad news is that very few companies still are able to really drive this data-driven culture. So why is that? That's because it's really, really hard. And it's hard for many reasons. It's hard because of how our, our organizations are structured and how were the data and analytics functions report to. And the technical depth that we sometimes incur and, and our data architecture and not being really able to, not being put together to really answer that broader strategic questions about our business. And, and sometimes it's also the talent and, and their analytics maturity. So it's a, for this many, many reasons, it's not that easy to build a data-driven culture. So in today's session, I'm going to focus on kind of practical steps of, of what it takes and how to get started and how to start this enterprise data literacy program and how to turn this into more mature offering over time. So, sure. hi, of course. <laughs> so with that being said, I'm really excited to be here at, at this conference. And before I go into the frameworks and, and more in-depth conversations about data and data-driven culture and data disruption, I'm going to tell you a bit about myself and a bit about Herbalife, the company I work for right now. So as you have sensed by now, there will be a lot of themes about disruption and about the really 
driving and moving the needle for your business. I'm Monica Kaczorski. I'm, uh, as Bob mentioned, the Vice President of Global Data Analytics and AI at Herbalife. I've been, throughout my career, I've been working for many multi-billion dollar organizations. And my goal has always been to transform the, the companies and really move the needle. Now, I have successfully built robust and resilient data cultures for across different industries and different geographies. I've worked for automotive and high tech and consumer electronics and now health and wellness industry. And uh, really at the root of the success, <laughs> it's, it's really the same thing. It's driving this <coughs> robust and, and resilient data culture. And I keep saying that I've been building data cultures before this became a trend and a buzzword. I've always have been about building the data cultures. Now, I have also pioneered a very effective enterprise analytics enablement program that I have mastered and proven over time to, to really um, drive impact and drive results. And we will talk a little bit about what it takes. And we will talk about actionable steps and, and frameworks that you can leverage from the, from the session and apply in your organizations. So we will talk about Herbalife. <laughs> So what is Herbalife? Um, are you familiar, are any of you familiar with the brand? Some nodding in the room? All right. Herbalife is a very disruptive company. And that's actually what, as a matter of fact, this is what drove me to this organization. The, or the organization is going through a really massive transformation right now. And it's this freedom of transformation to help the company write its next chapter that was really, really attractive to me. So when you hear Herbalife, some of you may think about this pyramid scheme from the 80s. <laughs> uh, and I see some nodding on the, of the heads, and it's great. And I assure you, it is not. It is a truly remarkable company that's really focused on the health and wellness, and it's really focused on really helping people living their best lives. Now, the roots start with its founder, Mark Hughes, who started this company 40 years ago. He truly revolutionized the business. He built this business based on disruption. He, direct, he invented, he, he started the direct sales business back 40 years ago, giving people an opportunity to start their own business, but also to um, sell this high value, high quality nutritional products. And what's really inspiring for me, I joined Herbalife about three months ago, and what's really inspiring for me is that honor that the employees still give to its founder and how profound he is across the company and how many walls still have Mark Hughes quotes and how we have Mark Hughes cafe and Mark Hughes uh, lunchroom and Mark Hughes bonus. He, he, he truly has been a remarkable individual. So how is Herbalife a number one health and nutrition company in the world today, selling more than 5.3 or shake, I mean, it's more than 5.3 million shakes being consumed every day. Well, it comes down to our product. And it comes down to one word, the quality of our product. And this is why the customers keep coming back every day. And this is why the company is where it is in terms of gaining the traction and adoption and, 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 and lo loyal customer base. And when I talk about the quality, this is not about just the quality of the ingredients, each and every ingredient that's carefully selected through our seed to feed process. This is also about the rigorous testing that our products um, go through on the ongoing basis. Our product is really backed by science and it's a science at cellular level. So we do a very thorough testing. It's about um, all the way to the botanical level. So question is, why am I talking about this and where am I going with this? The reason why I say this is that even this world-class data science, science, it truly is driven by data and analytics. So, now we're going to go through the journey. What does it take to build this you know, data-driven culture? What does it take to really disrupt your company with, with the data? And um, 
it's going to be a journey. So I'm from Michigan, so I'm having some automotive and road and, and auto themes. <laughs> Uh, because it's going to be a journey and it's not going to be easy. And why it's not easy? I bet you that if I, if I took the mic and walked around the room, all of you would come up with many, many, many examples. And I think the reason why it's not easy is that the data leader role has not been like really established yet or standardized yet. We all came in, as data leaders, we all came into this role through different doors. Some of us came to this data leadership role through IT, and some of us came to this role through finance. Some of us you know, were technology, some of us were business, so we're coming with different backgrounds. In addition, we also report to different functions. In my own career, I've reported to CDO and CIO and Chief Procurement Officer and Chief Innovation Officer. And guess what? They have all very different standards and very different expectations. My chief strategy and innovation officer could not care less about my talk about the data strategy and data structures. The chief innovation officer was just focused on like, what are you going to do for me with this data? All of this is behind the scenes. You take care of this, Monica. <laughs> when I report to the CIOs, they want to have nothing to do with the data culture because they are really, really focused on what is that tool strategy? <laughs> what is that our data architecture strategy? Let's focus on, on, on the specific technical aspects. And there is all of the game of those, those leaders in between. So as a data leader, <laughs> not only you come from different backgrounds, but you now also report to the leaders who have very different set of expectations. Now, it's also about the landscape and technology and data landscape that you walk into when you enter the organization. And quite often, you're coming in and you are coming to really inherit the data architecture that has been built quite tactically for very specific reasons. And when you're trying to get the big picture of the organization, it typically um, takes a little bit more work. And sometimes I just come to the organization, nuke completely the existing architecture and, and rebuild it from scratch and stand it up from scratch really quickly. And it's also about the talent. Sometimes you inherit the teams that really um, are very technical and do not know how to properly engage with the business to drive those outcomes. And sometimes you inherit the teams that think that they know what they are doing, but they, are, uh, they do not necessarily know exactly what they are doing and how to drive this strategically and at scale and at speed. So for this and many, many different reasons, it's not that easy to really drive this really robust and resilient and cohesive data culture. And the stats prove this. So this is one of the recent Harvard uh, Business Review studies when 92% of the CDOs claim that they have some measurable value from the data and analytics initiatives, but merely 21% say that they established this data culture. So the good news is that it can be done. <laughs> and I've done this numerous times. And I've done this for the organizations across different levels of maturity, organizations across different, um, different levels of even having the organizations. I've built, I, was in the, I walked into the organizations where I built the data and analytics team from the scratch. I came to the organizations where the analytics team has not been seen as really performing well or adding business value and seen as the sinking ship and the, the, or the company wanted me to come and help and turn around the sinking ship. And I also came to the companies that were so readily investing in analytics and bought all of the tools and all of the talent and all of the technologies and everybody was so happy creating dashboards <laughs> that it's a whole different spectrum of the problem where the leadership at the end of the day really has no idea what's going on because the conversations at the leadership table are still not about how do we drive business value, but those conversations are about who's right and whose data is right and whose definition is right and whose dashboard <laughs> makes sense. So, so I've done it all. And again, the good news is it can be done. So I'm going to talk about some of the real world use cases of what does the good look like when you actually build that good data culture? And what does it mean in terms of like really driving the business outcomes? So I do have a few of the examples. We can, uh, I try to make this this presentation fairly short, 40, 45 minutes, so you guys can have, you know, ask more questions. But 
I, I can probably give you 100, 200 more of this type of use cases of how do you really drive the value? How do you really ma measure the success? And one of the, of the uh, examples is our, my manufacturing company, where we have optimized how the quality and how the supply chain functions were working together. Like with any company, they were working in silos. The, 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 um, supply chain team was really being measuring measuring their success by their own KPIs of how do we how do we get the cost at the cheapest price and the quality team was really measuring their success at you know, how do I really get the vendors that have the highest quality barely ever they really talk to one another so my procurement team was on, on one set of spectrum of hey this is this five million dollar business that we're going to source to this supplier they could not care less about some of this anecdotal <laughs> escalations from quality team about the issues here and there. And it wasn't until we have kind of merged their ability to see the big picture together, until we allow them to see that, hey, this, 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 this vendor that you are still like so really like trusting you know, to put all of your multi-year investment in, that vendor had all of this. Uh, complaints and they took X amount of time to resolve them and they had some unauthorized changes. Bottom line, the big picture was, was that it was a disaster and a fiasco. Now that we have combined the organizations to speak the same data language, the company as a company made a whole different strategic decisions to exit the suppliers as, as opposed to giving them the strategic business. So that's just one of the examples of what happens when you really enable people to speak the same business language? What happens when you get them out of their own silos, but have them, have them really talk, um, um, talk in the, in from basically look uh, at talking to, the diff to, to one big um, cohesive perspective. Another example is the consumer electronic business. I've been at the company that was really suffering the sales, one of, with the sales, one of their businesses was going down. We looked at how to repivot the business. Again, engage the right level of the organization, engage the right level of stakeholders, and, and build that customer 360 that um, focus on bringing data from inside data and outside data that really focus on our customer journey. It was about really fostering the dialogue about what is it that we're trying to achieve as a company. And, and what our end goals are. And once we focus on the customer, what's important to the customer and the customer journey, we were really to then able to repivot of how do we target the customer in terms of not spamming the customers, but really understanding their journey and coming to at the point that were really relevant to them. And for this particular company, over the course of what we call Cyber Five, which is Cyber Friday uh, to the Cyber Monday, um, 30% of our revenue was happening during that time with the customer 360, with the revised or renewed way of looking at the customer together. We bumped out that revenue by 40% in that quarter. So think about the, 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 the impact that, that this type of work had on the company. Uh, high tech, uh, that's a, one of the examples where I joined in and had the chaos of the dashboards and the tools and the data tables. And we cut, got it to the point of how do we take it from chaos and how do we bring it to the insights that, that matter? And how do we get leadership aligned on the same page? And how do we have our chief revenue officer speaking to the chief product officer with more insights? And how do we have chief product officer figuring out which new features, software features, do I invest in that are not just complaints from the customer, the squeaking wheel um, gets them the oil, but how do I strategically invest in building up that product roadmap? Those level of conversations, empowering those level of conversations and giving the leaders this level of visibility, helping them with figuring out what are the KPIs that matter, what's the best in class look like, how is the best of the breed what are the best of the breed KPIs that our competition is measuring us by selves, um, themselves by? This is the level of insights that help us build that culture. So it's not a technical conversation. I really drive the business dialogue and foster business conversations. So when I talk about the frameworks <laughs> and what do you do and how do you get, how do you go to, um, to really transform the landscape of your company? What do you do to really change the narrative and change the, the dialogue, 
one thing you cannot control is, is um, the talent that you inherit, the landscape, the technology landscape that you, you inherit, who you report to. Those are the circumstances out of, outside of your control. The, the, I think the key is to embrace it and figure out how to adapt to your existing environment. So that work, that creating data culture before you try changing anybody else, <laughs> this work starts with you, with the data leaders. And this presentation will be really about seven mantras or seven key tips for seven days of the, of the week <laughs> for you to self-reflect and think about in terms of what you as a data leader can be doing differently or you can you know, reflect upon to really drive this culture. So one is, number one is you really need to brace yourself. <laughs> Creating a data culture is going to be a ride. <laughs> You buckle up. It's going to be a journey. You're going to get some, some bruises, sometimes some broken bones, <laughs> and you'll recover. <laughs> but um, just get ready. Get ready for this massive effort that's not a one-time thing. Some people think that you know, sending data culture starts with just sending an email. Hey, I released the dashboard. I have my go live announcement. I'm done. <laughs> this is my data culture. This is not even where the data culture begins. This is the beginning of it. Um, so we'll talk about this more, but at first, brace yourself. It's going to take some, some effort. My, my, another big advice is treat your data and analytics team as if it was your own business. We are not in the business of collecting data requirements and um, having tactical way of approaching how many dashboards they deliver, did they deliver them in time, on time and in budget. This is table stakes. This is just one small, small as aspect of running the data and analytics team. If you start looking at running the data and analytics team holistically, if you truly start treating this as your own business, that is also going to generate a lot more results. And when I say treat this like your own business, that means all of it. How you market, how you influence, how you sell the vision. How do you show your leaders the art of the possible? How do you, how do you campaign for funding? A lot of the, rec the complaints I'm hearing from chief data officers is that, you know, my role is so important, but I only get X amount of funding. How can I achieve all of this? Uh, and if my role is so important, how come I'm not getting more funding? Well, guess what? That's also part of our responsibility. Showing and deriving the value um, showing the CEO, CIO, whoever you report to, what you're trying to, what investment you require to deliver what, I, uh, what outcomes, that's also, also part of your responsibility. I don't think as data leaders we should play the victims of what budget is available for us. This is also where we need to step up and come to the table and really believe in this. I remember when I was much younger in my career and when I was like really campaigning for my first funding from, from the board. Um, at some point, I, I was driving home thinking, like, oh my goodness, if this is not going to work, are they going to repossess my house? <laughs> but that was my conviction. And this is how much I believed in my, product, my, my projects. And this is how much I believe in the value proposition. And this, is, this also then is reflected in how people see this, in, in how people see you and how much people are in, willing to invest in you. Um, so it's also about being able to create the ROI. It's also about really building up your te ta team and talent and inspiring your ta talent and, and building, building that, that team that's going to have your back, that's going to understand your vision, and it's going to be your soldiers that, that, are, that are able to execute on this vision. So it's a lot more running the effective data analytics team that dis disrupts the culture. It takes a very different approach than just building the dashboards or the data structures. Another big recommendation coming from my experience is really capturing the big picture. What is it that's most important for your organization? What's most important for your CEO? What, what is the company's current situation? Are we trying to build and innovate with the new product? Are we trying to really focus and improve the quality? Are we trying to enter the new markets? Are we, 
are we doing really, really well with our revenues, but we're spending so much that we really need to now focus on our efficiencies and the costs? Are we really need to f do we really need to focus on the profitability? <coughs> That's where you start as a data leader. What's the big goal and objective for the organizations? Get to know and get to understand the functions and what they are after. And once you understand and capture that big picture, that's when you can become a really powerful partner at the table. Because that's another complaint I'm hearing from the data leaders. I'm not having a seat at the table. And, and what, well, how do I turn around things to have, to, to have that seat at the table? Well, you need to, as a data leader, as these new, new functions, you kind of almost have to show this value. And um, for the organizations that, that have the data leaders embedded much deeper, this is, this is how you come to the table. You capture the big picture, and it's hard. It's a lot harder than, again, just trying to prioritize the projects that are in your pipeline. Another one is just really walking in your stakeholders' shoes. <laughs> Uh, really understand their pain points. It's not about just a quick exercise of what business value are we going to bring and, and is this going to make this whole team looking, looking flashy. This is really about understanding the pain points, the innovation, the disruption. It barely ever just comes from the leadership. Quite often it comes from people in the trenches. And one, ex one of the examples, like one of my favorite uh, people back at, at Borg Warner, Charles Erdy, he, he was one of the people on the plans in operations. And he was so passionate about resolving Borg Warner warranty issue that he like, really did dig, into his, <laughs> dig his heels into the problem. And he, and he couldn't understand why you know, we, we thought our product was good and we, are, we were getting all of these warranty returns. And he, he looked at data a million different ways. Nothing made sense. He looked into the technician comments. And then he got his eureka moment. He figured out that it was the customer who installed our product incorrectly who, who drove all these problems. With this discovery, that alone was $5 million uh, warranty claims that we were able to dispute and save for Borg Warner. The point is, if we didn't listen to Charles, <laughs> if we didn't spend time tr trying to understand where he is, empowering him to get the right data to ana analyze this, this would never happen. So really listen to people in the trenches, people who are closest to data, people who are closest to the business, because there is a lot of wisdom, a lot of power, and a lot of innovation there. Um, that's a tough one, too. Be the force that aligns the organization at the top. I do not see the chief data or the VP of data analytics leader's job as a technical job. This is really a lot of the work, a lot of my effort goes into aligning the organization, into really having a proper dialogue and fostering a right level of conversation between our leaders in quality and leaders in sales, leaders in finance, and really bringing them together in terms of how do we prioritize. And this one. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. It goes back to the fact that we all are coming to data and analytics world, or most of us, from very different angles. As I mentioned, some technical, some business. And we come and we bring very different skill sets. The reason for this butterfly, I think I saw it on, on LinkedIn somewhere, somewhere. Somebody posted a story that a little boy saw the butterfly trying to come out of the cocoon, and he took the scissors and cut it very gently so that the butterfly could get out. And guess what? This butterfly was very weak, had a very weak, weak, weak wings, and, and could not fly. And, and the moral of the story, the grandfather said, hey, if you let him stay in the cocoon, if you there is a reason for this cocoon so that he can practice the muscle so that by the time it gets out of the cocoon by itself, it can really fly. And that's the analogy for you for the data leaders too. We come with different skill sets and some are technical and, and we often miss a big chunk of the skill sets, whether it's communication, whether it's understanding the business functions, sales, supply chain, and so, et cetera, et cetera. It's okay. It is part of the journey, and we have to accept this, and we have to be willing to learn, we have to be willing to exercise those muscles so that our organization can truly fly. And I think that's one of the like, really, really key takeaways. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. I talked about those bruises and broken bones. It's okay. Part of the learning, part of their journey, what <laughs> uh, each one of those roadblocks, each one of those obstacles are going to make you stronger and be better data leader. 
And finally, I talked a, lot, a little bit about this. It's inspiring and influencing and selling the vision and, and do this across the board. This is with your own team. This is with your stakeholders. This is with your leadership. What is that art of the possible? Show them the art of the possible. Make them fall in love with the art of the possible. It's, it's really um, engage them in a way that's going to help you drive the disruption. It's, it's just once you come and once you meet your stakeholders and meet your leaders where they are in terms of understanding data and analytics and the art of the possible, this is when the magic happens. But again, this is a really, really big responsibility of the data leaders. So those are seven mantras <laughs> for seven days of the week, a lot to digest and a lot to think about. <laughs> but as I mentioned, there are things we can control and there are things that we cannot. And as, as, as long as we start with ourselves first, this is when the transformation starts. And this is when you can inject it to the rest of the organization. This is when you can embed it as part of the DNA of your company. So now that we talked about what we can do with you as a data leader, we will move on into some of the practical frameworks for data culture. And, and once we've done all of this heavy duty work on us and we're devo developing who we are, we're going to focus on, on what does it take? <laughs> and first, building this, this, the culture, um, like what does it take to get started? I'm actually going through this with my team. How do we take the first tactical steps to really foster the right level of dialogue and how to kind of build, make a mark and start being seen as, as, as consistent and cohesive team that reports and that really communicates in a consistent way. And that has to do with things like, what's the vision and the mission for your team that's aligned with the vision of the mission of your company? What is that first um, really uh, logo that you create <laughs> for your team? What is that consistent communication methodology and the rollout framework for your analytical applications? Guess what, somebody said that for analytical applications to for the communication to really stick at the organization, you need to have seven touch points. So when we roll out the applications, it's not just this one, hey, the dashboard went live. We do the campaigns, we do the solution profiles, we do the, the um, pre-release communication, post-release communications, engagement with the users, gathering the momentum. Um, it's, it's a really nice and robust framework, well thought out framework that allows us to repeat the message in a way that sticks <laughs> in a way that engages the, the audience. It's also about building that culture and that analytics academy. It's about building the ability for the people to really get easy access to data. This is how we get started. And then this is more of a longer term approach and this would probably warrant its own separate session, maybe next year that I will focus just on this very specific framework uh, of what it takes to launch. But that is when we take things to the le next level, when we've done the basics, we've got the branding, we've got the rollout frameworks, we've got the optimized way of communicating, we've got the, the, the nice level of, of, of analytics academies. This is where we really launch the self-service, but the governed self-service with some guardrails that allows the, the, the people to participate in a meaningful way and still um, collaborate, but also with the speed and, and scale. It's, it's an art in the whole separate program. It's how you build the events. It's how, it's how you build the promotional campaigns. It's how do you really engage people in, in power hours. And it goes into that, how do you create the win-win-win scenarios? How every launch and every success that you do for your company becomes Again, win, win, win. Win for your team because we've, you've de delivered this incredible project, project. Win for your business stakeholders because now they have the insights that they need to really um, make impact and make decisions differently. And win for the company because company as a whole becomes a better company. So it's that culture of creating win, win, win scenarios that helps to remove the friction that often happens in the companies when, when teams start doing their own analytics and, and shadow efforts. Um, bringing them back together is an art, and that art starts through this win-win-win culture. That is critical. What you measure matters, and, and that will also really shape how successful you are with building your culture. If you measure your team 
based on did they deliver on time, is the st are the stakeholders happy, um, is the application done within the budget, <laughs> are all of the KPIs and targets met, that's how your team will perform. <laughs> they will be very tactically oriented team, very much in the servitude mode, <laughs> serving the customer. And if this is how you measure your team, this is eventually the type of the behavior this type of measurement will drive, and your team will never be at this strategic table. Your team will never be a partner. If you start changing the narrative, if you ch start changing how you measure, and it's about the business outcomes, your team will start acting differently. Your team will come to the table differently. If we're really focusing on how do we drive the revenue and how do we reduce the costs, how do we improve efficiency, if we're really rallying our teams about the outcome, this will really create a culture shift for your own team and this will be very apparent for your stakeholders because your team will engage in a very different dialogue. So you see where I'm getting this? This whole building the culture, it's not just one place, it's not just one template, it's not just one communication, you really have to skillfully work throughout the communication with the senior leaders, with your own team, with people in the trenches, you really have to inspire this organization and it's a huge responsibility uh, as a data leader. And finally, once you've got it, <laughs> this is when you come to the portion where you rinse, rinse, repeat, and scale. And it's a very rewarding place to be. It comes with its own challenges, but, but uh, and it takes some time to get there, but I promise you that once you get there, it, it is an incredible place to be. So I'm going to bring it home now, because my journey has, uh, my transformation journey uh, with the multi-billion dollar organizations, as I mentioned, automotive, consumer electronics, high-tech, wellness, all very different challenges. But what took me five, six years to establish at one com company, I was able to do within the three years and my next company. I was able to do within two years in yet my next company because by now I have the frameworks and the, the methodologies and the beliefs that I know they work. And the beautiful thing is that I don't have to do it all. It's inspiring your team. It's inspiring your stakeholders. It's inspiring your vision. It has a really uh, cascading effect. and um, and. And that, um, in terms of the impacts, like some of the impacts they want to really take, take talk about, it was positioning the $8.5 billion company to become a $15 billion company, to generate enough of the cash flow to be able to do the $3 billion acquisition. It's about helping the company to really weather the COVID-19 pandemic so that if one fourth of their business really melted away with COVID, we were able to re-pivot and start the new revenue streams somewhere else. <laughs> it's about helping the hardware company, 100% hardware company, transition to be the fourth largest software company in the world. This is the, the final outcomes, and this is the final transformation that I'm discussing here. And I'm just really, really thrilled about joining Herbalife and I'm really, really thr thrilled to see what company Herbalife will be two or three years from now because I have very, very big <laughs> and ambitious plan plans for them. Um, just in a touch of the testimony, uh, what you can hear from your leaders when you know you've done things right. <laughs> the first one is the quote from the CEO of Borg Warner. Now, I was the winner of the CEO Innovation Award. And I'm really, really proud because as automotive company, they're very, they were very conservative. And the Innovation Award is typically given for an invention with powertrain and more of the you know, electric motor and so on. This is the first time in the company's history <laughs> when the Innovation Award was given for data. And it was James Verrier uh, on the stage giving me a word and saying, Monica, never in a million, a hundred of years would I have thought that I would be giving an award for data. <laughs> but here you are because of the profound impact you've made on this company. And then he has given me this innovation awards two years later as well for data. Data transformed and revolutionized Borg Warner. Another quote from um, the chief supply chain operations officer 
who basically said that the power of productivity that we unleashed for the organization, that um, it was a game changer. And he basically said, this is driving a significant culture shift for us. So when you can get those quotes <laughs> from the C-level and the highest level leaders in the organization, you know <laughs> you've done things right. But again, there is no real magic like recipe. There is no real secret sauce. Overall, this is for me about rolling up the sleeves, <laughs> believing uh, in, in being able to drive results, pouring my heart, energy, and passion into this, and bringing everybody in the organization along the way. So over time, as I mentioned, I do this faster, <laughs> I do this better, and I do this at a bigger scale. So my, the roads get faster, the mountains get bigger, but the rewards I can bring for the organizations are also becoming much, much higher. My motivation, just like I know for many of you, many of you who are in the data space, you are here because you like driving change, you like driving impact. So my motivation is making change. I live for change. I'm inspired by change and, and moving the needle for my organization has always been the overarching theme for, for my work. Uh, and finally, Right fuel matters. Um, I think that was one of the best quotes from the CFO at, uh, at one of the companies I've worked for, who basically said, all these IT people like buying their new toys, uh, their new technologies. It's like, you know, we're buying the, it's like buying the Corvette, <laughs> uh, but putting a kerosene into this and wondering <laughs> why the car doesn't move. And this is also about, you know, having this data culture, data culture that fuels the organization. But now I want to actually shift to, to the data and technology providers because it's also really important who do you partner with. This is not just about the bells and whistles. This is about partnering with the right level of the company who's really to help you and embrace this innovation and who's going to help you along the, partner with you effectively and help you along the way. So summary key takeaways, starts with transforming yourself first and building the right level of partnership and strategizing what to measure so that I've heard this overarching theme here so that we've moved from this cost center to, to the innovation center. So I wanted to thank you for your time and thank MIT organizers for this conference, for creating this forum for us to, to collaborate. Uh, thank you to, for StreamSets for sponsoring and, and hosting this session and um, and I will be ready to take any questions. I left you quite a few time, quite a bit of time for, for questions. Uh, but before we go there, again, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One sec, please. If you could just introduce yourself and where you're coming from. Sure. Hi, uh, Monica. Nice to meet you and uh, great presentation. Thank you. I'm Sylvester Morgan. I lead data for Cummins, uh, the engine power systems company. I, I was curious about your supply chain example, if you could kind of elaborate a little bit in terms of the, the business impact you've made relative to that supply chain example. Yeah, so the question is how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Because that is one of the like really mountains of of the impacts that are waiting in the supply chain aspect, whether it is um, creating the supplier scorecard <laughs> that allows you to measure your supplier not just by the cost reductions but also by how many CPMs complaints per min per million, how many unauthorized changes, how many on time deliveries, how many innovation points. That alone allows you to have a really robust view at, at your supplier. And that alone allows you to look at your supply base a lot more strategically across all of the angles. Uh, but that, it also translates to something else. Once you're having conversations, your sales, your, your um, supply chain leaders are having conversations with your suppliers, the suppliers always come and they are seeking, you're in comments, you know, they always come and they are seeking the price increases. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful when you can have this 360 view of supplier and say, you're coming for the price increases, but you know, guess what? <laughs> you were late here and you did not really address this complaint over there and you did not do X, Y, and Z. And oh, by the way, in this region, I have two other alternatives. Now this is a really powerful negotiation ability to really have a very meaningful dialogue. Um, 
you know, some of the like most incredible uses of my supply chain uh, applications were like not even, I never even intended <laughs> those uses, but because people trusted the data and they trusted the output. Like I'm, I'm now learning that um, some of our quality people are using my supply chain uh, dashboards because they want to plan where do we do audits, <laughs> where do we travel, how do we travel the world, and how do we do audits to, uh, to, to do them flawlessly and seamlessly. And that also happens because they're looking at the supply chain dashboards. Uh, it's, it's, we can have a whole separate session, but the amount of the, that's where the dollars is. This is actually why I was you know, really hired for, for to Borg Warner. It was about how do we drive the company's profitability. It was how do we um, help the company with, with, with supply chain. For the manufacturing company, that's probably similar to yours. Yeah, I was for, hired by the supply chain leader. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, so for every dollar you make in revenue, quite often manufacturing company spends 50 cents in the direct material spend. So any efficiency you can drive in the direct material spend will be a significant ability to really move the needle and help your com companies with the profitability. So, so those are just some, some examples, but there's plenty Plenty, plenty more. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else questions in the room? One in the back. Good afternoon, Monica. My name is Mark Kogma. I'm the Chief Transformation Officer at Aon and uh, support a lot of uh, federal clients in their data operations. And one of the challenges we have in our data culture is it's interesting we can get motivated in the those people that are doing the data science and the business analytics and the data coding because that's the hot market right now and they can earn big bucks. But I got those people that are doing, I'll call the hard work, the grunt work of the data management, seeking that things and trying to keep those people motivated because that's not, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, sexy anymore from that perspective. And so, for, you know, it's one, in one way it's able to motivate those people on the one end, but how do you keep the whole team motivated when there's less exciting jobs from that perspective. Thanks. This is a great, great question, Mark. And I'm smiling because I, I have a couple of my team members here and we, we had that very exact discussion. There are those, as you called, sexy jobs that are like interfacing with the business that really are really um, focused on, on providing value. This is great. And then there's the grant work. And I think it goes back to me um, having that mantra of, helping and painting the big picture. Big picture, how it is all coming together. Um, it's how it's not just that particular visualization team or a BI team that's delivering all this impact. Painting like, really the big story of what it takes <laughs> to really bring this amazing data together. It's, it's, I think it's a big job of the leader, of the leader to, to step up <laughs> and elevate and give the visibility to the broader team, but it's also, it's also helping the technical team that's down in the trenches that does less visible work. It's helping them understand what is the business problem we're solving. How are they contributing to the big picture? That's also the motivation. I've done X, and this X now motivated these different decisions. It's it also you know goes back to what how you measure and what you measure. If you measure the success on these tactical wins, it's one thing. If you measure the success on what is the long term value of the decisions that are being now differently because of this insights that your entire team delivered, that, that, that's huge. That makes a whole difference in the world in how we motivate them, in how we bring them to the table, and how they feel about their, their uh, contribution. Another thing that I'm doing to, to drive this culture is also things like power hours. <laughs> where I have different team members come to the table and present and make the broader team aware of what it takes. And people love those exposure opportunities. Well, some do, some, some don't, but it's, it's, it's another avenue to create and shine some light on, 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 the, on the team that's hidden behind the scenes. So I think it's a big, in a big portion the, the goal for us and the data leader. And I, I'm looking at that too because we, we just had this conversation. I told you, you know, it's leading the MDM team and we were just discussing how do we bring them closer? How do we bring MDM team as part of the overall huge win for the company, driving the re revenue for the company as, as opposed to having this just standalone technical team that's doing a really good job uh, but it's not getting the right level of visibility on the, or the right level, or level of motivation. So it goes back to to us, the leaders, taking the ownership and responsi responsibility to pre provide this transparency, provide this visibility, and really inspire and ignite our people. 
Thank you, Mark. Hi, this is Ivan Herrero from Innercorp Peru. Um, you've been talking a lot about um, data culture and measuring what it matters. And when we talk about a culture, uh, we normally talk about um, behaviors and, and what people believe across the organization. So do you have um, any metrics specifically uh, pointed to measure how um, those behaviors are changing across the organization related to the use of, of data? Uh, apart from the outcomes of the transformation, uh, to be able to, to measure if some key behaviors are changing and how people are using uh, data in a different way along the, the transformation process. So do you mean the people on your own team or people within people the organization? Within the organization. Absolutely. So it starts with the, and thank you, Ivan, for the question. So some of the basic measure, and I was obsessed at the earlier stages of my career, and I always had one monitor that showed me how many people are living and breathing daily in my dashboard. So the usage and the stat statistics is one thing. <laughs> But what's really changing the behavior is when they feel, feel like they are par part of this win-win-win culture, when they come and share the win and win stories, when they want to co-create and publish those stories, when they speak, I think my own like, personal metrics for success, when I don't have to come to the CEO or the CL to tell them what I've done, when he hears about what I've done, <laughs> before I even tell him, because the stakeholders are happy and the business partners are happy. And, and that just really creates so much goodwill. It creates so much momentum. Um, so it's ability of people to be really attribute this, the, the win to, uh, to impartially at least to the data and analytics is, is there, is there, I mentioned um, to one of the questions earlier, it's, you know, it's changing the behaviors, okay? Right now they are planning supplier audits based on the supply chain data. It's, 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 it's those stories that, that, um, that really make a difference. I don't know that they have a very specific metrics. But yeah, th um, those are more perceptions, but uh, do you have some examples of uh, how to track the evolution of the culture down in quantitative uh, KPIs, quantitative metrics? So uh, me personally, we measure the success based on the company's success. I uh, align my OKRs with the company's OKRs. We really, it really so business outcomes focused that I personally align my teams with, with, the, with, with the company's really goals. That's, that's my mantra. I also do not want to get into the business of having too many metrics and too many measures because at some point we need to get the work done. With analytics, you know, with all of these technologies and tools, you can basically measure everything. You can measure how many hair you have on your head. But again, what's the value at the end of the day? Uh, it takes time. It takes momentum. So I much prefer to focus my team on the business outcomes and how do we um, um, support those than having yet stand alone, May maybe at some point, but I haven't come across this yet. I think you know, this approach that I'm taking is, has been so successful in the past that I did not really find a compelling need to create a whole bunch of separate metrics to measure how people de behave differently. Maybe I will at some point, so thank you for the inspiration, Ivan. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions in the room? Otherwise, we do have a few questions from the actual the virtual attendants. So. Any other questions from the room? Okay. Um, one of them is around, uh, let me find this one. How much of the data-driven, how much uh, is the data-driven culture dependent on people versus process? It is combined. It is, it is people, process, um, technology. It, it really is combined. Because quite of, of, often when I joined the organization, the processes are, are broken and inefficient. And it starts with people. I always started start people because people are the heart of this. Very often throughout the journey, we are able to shine the light on the problems with the process and we're able to impact the process, influence the process, disrupt the process. So it starts with people, but people process technologies are all important. Great. Next one is a little bit lengthy, but I'll try to you know, I paraphrase a little bit. Uh, how do you keep the pace 
to constantly deliver value and also being innovative and up to date with the latest technologies, trends, tools for you and your analyst teams. You know, and they, they add a few other pieces. So we'll, we'll, we'll sort of pause right there to see if you have any thoughts on that question. I love it, love it, love it, because that's the question that I ask, sometimes ask myself at night. Like, how am I still keeping up? And it's, it's, it's the people. It's the people you surround yourself. It's the people that you empower and people that you trust and people that you build up. It's your first level of the direct leaders that you build up over time that you know you can trust on. And that helps you multiply and that helps you scale. And that is um, people. It's not just the full-time employees. Very often it's also the vendor partnerships, it's having the incredible vendors that also you, where you can know that they will have your back. Um, so my answer is people. Uh, it's, it's, it's people, it's building the relationships, it's building the trust. Uh, it's, it's, it's happened quite a few times that when I leave the organization, the entire analytics team follows. Uh, it's, it's not unusual, but, but that is what helps me scale. That is what helps me keep on top of things. Great, and I think we have time for one last one. And this one might be related, but Monica, you talked about in your presentation that getting to a data-driven culture is a journey. And so I guess the question is, how do you handle resistance or challenges when trying to create that data-driven culture? Okay, so some of it is my personal charm. <laughs> some of it is, is, is really, um, some of it is really trying to understand where the resistance is coming from. There is typically a really good reason for the resistance. Either people were underserved of the data in the past, they have been hurt in the past, they have been fighting for the survival. It's really understand where does the pain come from? And, and it's really about meeting your, your stakeholders or your resistors where they are at. It's really trying to understand them before we try to force our, our um, approach. It's, it's the collaboration and yet assertive. It's also being able to show them your value propositions, being able to show them your, your vision and where things are ha going. And it's really about, at the end of the day, it's a skillful negotiation too. And also, I think one of my advice is like, don't try to like, really pick, pick up all of the battles. <laughs> When you start on this journey, figure out who your like, first champions are, who are the first people who are really willing to work with, with you, and figure out those first wins, and celebrate those wins, and publish your wins. If you just try to pick up every fight <laughs> and every battle, uh, it, you're going to waste a lot of calories <laughs> for, for really no, <laughs> no good reason. So like, be smart about which hill you want to die, uh, die on. And, and again, it goes back to also having the empathy uh, a lot of what I do is, is really being, you know, having a lot of empathy for different functions. And it has to do with me being in supply chain and finance and IT and operations. So I have been in their shoes. I understand their shoes. This is why I can speak their language. Not all of you have been in different functions. But, but you know, my advice is try to understand where they are coming from, what pain uh, that they have incurred in the past is causing the resistance, and then figure out. Do I leave it and move on somewhere else and to, to fry a, you know, have a bigger fish to fry? Or um, do I still work with the stakeholder and, 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 and work in a skillful way? It's like the negotiation, like anything else in life. I have kids. I have a 17-year-old, 9-year-old. I keep negotiating every day. <laughs> so um, it's, it's kind of part of the, the life that we need to embrace. <laughs> Monica, thank you so much for the wonderful insights. And everybody, thank you for attending the session, but thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you.